Hey folks, James Brandon here, and in this video, I want to show you some of the ways that I like to use On One's Perfect Photo Suite 7 in conjunction with Lightroom 4. And as many of you know, Lightroom 4 is an incredibly powerful program, but it does have its limits, and that's why a lot of people have Photoshop as well, because Photoshop can do a lot of the really powerful things that Lightroom isn't capable of. I like to use Lightroom for all my uh, image sorting and um, my light edits to moderate edits on images. There's a lot you can do in this program. But one thing you can't do is layers. Um, another thing you can't do is masking. Um, you, can, you can use brushes to uh, create some auto masks, but that's not really masking like you would see in Photoshop. Um, and a lot of people can't afford Photoshop. So when On One came out with perfect layers, it was a huge deal because for the first time you could use uh, layers alongside Lightroom without having to go to Photoshop. And with all of the other programs inside of uh, On One's Perfect Photo Suite, it's really just become an incredibly powerful and very versatile tool that I use um, almost on a daily basis with my images. So with all that said, let's go ahead and get started. So this is an image that uh, I took in Italy last year. This is in a, a town called Rio Maggiore, and it's in a region in Italy on the northwestern coast called uh, the Cinque Terre. And um, it's just an incredibly beautiful part of uh, Italy, and I love it so much. I, I fell in love with this town, and I can't wait to get back one day. But this was the first day that we were there, and I went here at sunrise to, uh, to take this photo from this viewpoint. And there's a couple of uh, issues that were um, before me. One is that it was uh, it was fairly dark outside. This is a long exposure, so it looks much brighter than it really was. Um, but to expose the town properly, I was going to blow out the sky. And a lot of times, you know, you'll take multiple uh, images at different exposure levels, like if you're shooting uh, HDR. Uh, in this case, I didn't completely blow out the sky, so I knew I could bring back the details later. But there's a, a few things that I really wanted in this image. Uh, one was the sky. I wanted a really nice purple bluish sky that I saw before me. Uh, two, I wanted the light burst in the uh, light sources here in the town. I really wanted that. And third, I wanted to freeze the boats in the harbor. With the long exposure, I got this nice <clears throat> uh, glassy surface on the water here. But since the boats were just kind of bobbing around, um, even, even though it was very still that morning, uh, it still created a lot of movement and the boats just aren't working for me. So what I had to do was I had to take two different exposures, uh, one long exposure to get the light burst in the, uh, in the town here. And then I had to take one quick exposure to freeze the boats. So normally you change your, um, your shutter speed when you're, when you're shooting something like HDR. In this case, I changed my ISO, my aperture and my shutter speed to create this image. Uh, right alongside it. So this is the same image, just shot different um, exposure, different aperture, different ISO, things like that. So I'll go back to this one, uh, bring up the information. This was a 30 second exposure at F20 at ISO 100. And then you come over here and we have one sixth of a second. Sorry about that. Um, we have one sixth of a second at F3.2 at ISO 500. So those are, um, very similar in the exposure uh, outcome, but very different in the fact that this one, you can see that we uh, lost the light bursts in the images here or in the in the town. So we don't have any of that because it was a faster exposure and the aperture was much more uh, open. And then the boats here, since we have a one sixth uh, of a second are frozen, which is just exactly what we wanted to do. So now that my uh, hard drive is back online there, it's been disconnecting lately, so I'm not sure what to do about that. Probably just have to replace it. It's, uh, it's a couple years old now. Um, so what I did here was I created a second copy, a virtual copy inside of Lightroom of this same image, and then I just darkened the exposure uh, here. So you can see that I took it down 1.6 stops on my exposure, brought back some of the highlights and the whites, I added some vibrance. I'm, on this one, I'm really only looking at the sky. That's all I'm concerned with. Um, since I'm going to be blending along this tree line, I'll probably bring my shadows up a little bit uh, just to make that look a little bit better uh, when I blend that so there's no dark spots on the ridge line. And then uh, if I come down all the way to lens corrections in manual, I 
uh, changed the lens vignetting a little bit, made it brighter around the edges because it was getting dark uh, on this side here. So that's all I did in here. Um, one thing I just noticed was here and here, my white balance is quite different. Um, I have to decide how uh, important that is here. And I don't think it's going to make that much of a difference because I'm, I'm just taking the, uh, the boat from this one. But what I'll do is I'll go ahead and sample this here and see how that looks. And that looks much closer, so I'll go with that. Um, I'll bump up the clarity, already done, blacks are good, contrasts, uh, bring that up a little bit, and sharpening, let's sharpen it just a little, looking at the, at the boats here, radius and detail, bring that up a little bit. Masking will kind of um, clean the, the noise up a little bit that's induced from sharpening, so you always want to do that a little bit, and then just a touch of noise reduction. And that should do it for these images. So I have these images finished in Lightroom. So now what I'll do is uh, hold down shift and select uh, this last one here without, which will select all three of them. And then I'll come to my file and plug in extras and then choose Perfect Photo Suite 7. And what you wanna do here mainly is just take them to the first program that you wanna use, which in this case is Perfect Layers 3. And now we'll just wait for uh, Perfect Photo Suite 7 to launch. And it's taking three large files here, three raw images straight from my camera. So I'm not using like websites files for video or anything. So, so it might take a little bit longer for it to open, um, but just bear with me here. So it's three images and this is Perfect Photo Suite 7. So what you see here at the top, uh, these used to be all separate programs and they really, they used to only operate with Photoshop which was a really awesome thing for people like me who, who used Photoshop, but for people who didn't, they really didn't have any access to On One. So now they started um, creating these programs to be independent from Photoshop, but still work with it. And now with the um, introduction of Perfect Layers a couple years back, now we have all of these programs together in one package, and it's just really awesome. So you have layers, you have perfect mass, perfect portrait, perfect effects, perfect black and white. Uh, focus is actually called focal point. I'm not sure why it still says focus up there. And then perfect resize, which is an incredible program that I use anytime I'm taking an image to, to print, no matter what. So in perfect layers, this if you have ever used Photoshop, you're going to notice that it looks very similar to Photoshop and that you have your layers down here, you have your blend modes, um, and you can do a lot just from inside of here. So this is all completely unrehearsed. So what I wanna do is just kinda of work through this image. And if I make any mistakes, you'll see them here. And I'll just go back and forth and correct them if need be. So the first thing I wanna do is I wanna take that sky in, uh, in this top image here, and I want to um, remove everything else in this image but the sky so that the sky appears on the image with the, uh, with the city. So I wanna first make sure that my layers are all um, ordered right. So let's see, uh, in mask, I'm going to take an image and I'm gonna paint through this with a uh, drop brush, which I'll show you here in a second. So I wanna be dropping the sky out. So what I'll actually do is come to the city one, I'll bring that up here. And I'll bring that actually up to the top. So this is actually the photo that I'll use um, to create a mask. And it's gonna be a mask and all the sky here is gonna be black, so it's gonna show the uh, purple and blue sky underneath that. So with that selected, I'll hit mask here. And that will load my image up, it's pretty quick. It's gotta prepare the image and get it all ready, but that's it. So perfect mask, now we're in a completely separate plugin or program or whatever you wanna call it. Uh, from layers, but we can go back to it at any time, which is great. So um, Perfect Mask works on the premise of, you know, you can really get out of it what you put into it. So if you don't put a whole lot into it, it's not going to give you a great mask every time. But if the more you put into it, the better your results you're going to get. And you'll see what I mean uh, by that here in a second. So at the very top over here on the toolbar, 
you have a plus sign with a paintbrush and a minus sign. So that's your keep and drop brush. So if I take my drop brush, and you can see how it's red, um, I'll just paint across the sky here, take a sampling of it, and then it's going to crunch through that and create a, a basic mask for me to use. And you can see here what it's done. Uh, it's, it's deleted the sky from this image um, and showing and now it's showing us whatever's beneath it in perfect layers, which is the darker exposure with the sky. And as you can see, I didn't put much into it. I, I put one single brush stroke into it and it got rid of the uh, sky, but now I need to do some cleanup work around the edges. And there's two ways that you can do that. If you have something really complex, they have these um, keep and drop eyedroppers. And you can take a keep eyedropper here. What do we want to keep? We want to keep the, uh, the foreground because we deleted the sky. So you just take some samplings of different parts of the foreground here that you wanna make sure stay in the image. And just go through the image and take a good sampling of that. And you can see them pop up in the keep palette over here on the right hand side. So then you would take your uh, drop eyedropper and then just sample some sections throughout the sky. They're all gonna be pretty similar because it was fairly blown out. And then from there you would take your, um, your perfect or your magic brush and then paint along the edges. So you want to make sure that you have auto on if you want it to reference these palettes. And then you would just paint along the edge here. And if, you, if I go into the sky here, you should see that come through. Uh, let's see. Uh, paint in. I'm sorry. I thought I was on auto and I was on paint in. And I was wondering why the, uh, the white wasn't going away. So let's go to auto, make sure that's selected. And now when I paint, you'll see that start to disappear. So that's one way you can do it. Uh, the next way you can do it is just by using a paint in or paint out brush. And I'm going to use a, um, a uh, paint out brush to so get rid of the, uh, the white in the sky here. And it'll only show through um, for the foreground exposure, which has those trees exposed. And I'll zoom in here so we can see things a little bit closer. Obviously, these chromatic aberrations are a huge uh, issue in this photo, but we'll address that uh, later. I can take it into Lightroom to correct that. Um, I haven't tried to do it in Perfect Photo Suite, so I'm not sure if there's a way to do that or not. There might be, but what I usually do is take the image into Photoshop um, just because it's the best way to do it. And I have Photoshop, so I'm going to use it if I can. Uh, if you don't have Photoshop, you can do it in Lightroom. You can do it in Aperture. You can do it in all those programs. Um, it's just not as you know neat and precise as you can do it in Photoshop. So I'm just painting along the edges here and cleaning everything up. Not paying attention to the chromatic aberrations again. Uh, those chromatic aberrations, by the way, are magnified when you combine exposures. They're not really that bad out of the camera, not even by a long shot. But when you start stacking exposures, you also stack the chromatic aberration. So it shows through um, a lot more than it normally would. So if you hit Command-0 on a Mac, uh, which would be Control-0 on a PC, that'll zoom out and fill the, uh, the screen with the image. And there you have a pretty decent mask um, showing the sky. So when I'm done with that, which I am, I'll hit apply and that's going to take us right back to perfect layers. And now if you look over here on the right, you can see that mask created. Uh, you can see black and white. Anything white on that mask is going to reveal anything on that layer where anything black is going to conceal. So white reveals while black conceals. So white is revealing the foreground and black is revealing the sky. It's punching that out of that mask to reveal anything beneath it. So that's the sky. So I hope that makes sense. And then uh, the another thing you can do in here, you can also do basic masking inside of layers because what are, what are layers without masking, right? Uh, so you really just use mask for, or perfect mask rather, for really in-depth and really precise masks. But what I can do here is I can select this layer 
and then come over here to my paintbrush and then I could refine this if I wanted to. So I'll zoom in, go over here, and let, I bet this will actually help me get rid of some of these, uh, this chromatic aberration. So I wanna double check what I'm doing here. I'm gonna paint out, I believe, so yes. So now you can see if I go along the edges here, it's gonna paint that out, and it's really gonna reduce those chromatic aberrations. What it's also going to do is make that ridge line a lot darker. So you want to be mindful of that as well. So one thing you can do is you can change the opacity. I can just drag this down and be a little bit more careful with that. And then I can make my feathers smaller. That way I can just really be more precise as I go along the edges there. Or you can make uh, the opacity really low and the feather really large and that will make the uh, the taper off effect uh, a lot more uh, you know minimal and you can even just kind of go along the ridge line there where you see that that's a little bit further away and that'll help conceal that a little bit better all right just go along here some more clean this all up i think this is going to look a lot better Be careful there. I'm still gonna have to do some of this uh, cleanup work in Photoshop later to get rid of the the CA. Just darken this ridge up a little bit. Make it look a little bit more uniform. Okay, get smaller again. All right, zoom out, make sure everything looks uh, kosher there. And I think it does. So the next thing that we wanna do is create another mask, which will show us the, um, the boats here in the harbor. So to do that, um, we might have to order, reorder the layers around here a bit. Um, if I just bring this up to the top actually, and then choose mask, and invert, that's gonna give me a black mask uh, on this top layer. And this top layer is only showing us the frozen boats. So since we put a black mask over it, we can't see anything else on this layer. All we can see are the layers beneath it, which is what we had before. So now I can select this layer with the black mask and go back to my brush and make sure I'm painting in again. And I'll go ahead and bump the opacity up to 100% and I'll drop the feather down a bit maybe around 40%. Use the bracket keys to make it the brush larger or smaller. And then I'll just paint over the water here. And you can see these boats just snap right into place, which is just so easy and so incredible and so convenient. I don't have to do anything complicated in here. Um, if I didn't have Photoshop, I could use this for free, which, which is just incredible. Perfect Layers is free uh, from Onwin Software. These other programs included in the Perfect Photo Suite are what uh, make up the price of the of the Photo Suite. So um, now we have completed uh, this this you know basic image. This is three uh, in essence three different exposures combined into one. So we have the exposure of the sky, uh, which was a virtual copy copy in Lightroom. We have the exposure of the foreground, which shows us this the uh, starbursts and the light sources. And we have the frozen uh, faster exposure that uh, froze these boats into place here in the foreground. So that's just one of the things you can do here in, uh, in the uh, Perfect Photo Suite from On One Software. And from here, I can take it into any of these other programs and stylize it. So now let me, let me just kind of think here what I'd like to do with this. Um, the best option for me here is probably to take it into Perfect Effects. And I'm sorry, what I want to do first is go back to layers and go to layer and then new stamped layer. And that's going to take all of these layers that I've worked on and merge them into one so that I can just work on that. So now I'll go back to perfect effects. And from here we can just see what I want to do with the image. So this is going to affect the entire image, whatever, um, whatever I add to it. 
and you have all these presets down here on the left side to choose from. So you kind of just want to go by your genre first of all. So this is a landscape or travel image. So you can go down here and there's a travel uh, or landscape folder here somewhere. I'm not seeing it for some reason. There it is. So this is one of the really cool things that I like about the new uh, Perfect Photo Suite 7. Before these presets, they ran along the bottom of the screen here. And what they used for the previews, the initial previews, were stock images that various photographers sent in that On1 uh, uses. So they would show these images that were completely unrelated to yours, and then you would just have to kind of you know guess how that would apply to your photograph. Or if you wanted to, you could hover over the image and it would bring up a thumbnail that would pop up to show you a preview. But sometimes it took a long time, especially if the image was really big, and it really just was, was cumbersome and I didn't like it. And now they, with the Perfect Photo Suite 7, they moved all of the presets over to the left and now they're using my image that I'm working on for the uh, preview, which is just awesome. So now I don't have to guess, I have it all right here. So I'll just go through these and see if there's any that I like and I can apply them if I want and leave them out if I don't, you know, no pressure. So I like what Magic Desert is doing initially um, to the saturation and vibrance of the image. So why don't I drop that on? I'll double click that. And it kind of darkened the image up and added some, uh, some vibrance and contrast and just punch to the image. I really like it. Um, I don't know if I'll actually do much else to this image. Sometimes you just get it to where you want it and you know why mess with a good thing if it looks great. So from here, um, I think I'm I think I'm gonna be done with this. So I'll just hit apply and that will take me back to layers. And now you have the perfect effects uh, layer added on to the uh, other layers that you've worked on in the past. So I think that's going to be it. I'm going I'm done with this image. I'm going to export it out. I'll, you know, bring it into Photoshop real quick to work on the uh, the chromatic aberration and that'll be that'll be it really. So I hope this has helped you. I know it was kind of a long video, but I really just instead of rehearsing it beforehand and, you know, going over exactly what I wanted to say and being precise, I thought it'd be better if I just went over it step by step for the first time and just kind of worked my way through the image. So I hope you liked it. And if you have any questions, leave them in the comments below, or you can uh, hit me up on Twitter. Uh, my, my Twitter handle is at James D. Brandon, or uh, you can leave, if, if you're listening to this or watching it on Digital Photography School, you can leave a comment uh, below in the comment section. So I uh, hope this helped and I'll talk to you later. Bye. All right, so now if you're still with me, uh, I want to do a quick bonus video to show how I would stylize this image further and finalize it in uh, Photoshop. And one of the really cool things uh, to consider about perfect layers is that if you do have Photoshop and you really just like working in perfect layers and perfect photo suite seven, uh, like I do, you can always export to Photoshop if you still need to. And it's going to preserve all these layers over here on the right. Um, just like you would see them in Photoshop. So you'll see that here in a minute. So now that I'm done with this image, all I have to do is hit save and it's going to save this as a PSD. And that's just the standard. That's the, that's the way that it saves these files. Even if you don't have Photoshop, it's going to save them in Lightroom or Aperture as a PSD. And then from there you can export it out as a JPEG if you'd like. So if I hit command tab, and come over here to Lightroom, now you'll see this PSD sitting in uh, the same folder that I was working out of Lightroom in. And you can see the file name here, 1ds1339.psd. Uh, we'll turn the info off there. And that's what I created in uh, Perfect Layers in the uh, Perfect Photo Suite 7. So from here, if I still wanna do some further work on this and I wanna remove those chromatic aberrations, I might want to touch up some of the uh, brushwork around here. I could do that in Perfect uh, uh, Photo Suite 7 if I wanted to. Uh, just take it back into there and tweak it, but I'll just do it in Photoshop since I'm going there anyways. And um, I can't think of a whole lot else I want to do, but we'll see when we get in there. So from here, I'll right click this image and edit it in Photoshop. 
and edit original is just fine. And now we are in Photoshop and you can see here that we have all of the same layers that I created in perfect layers. The darker layer, the uh, layer with the, with the starburst and the lights with that mask that I created to uh, pull the sky in. The layer with the frozen boats uh, right here where I just brush that in um, you know, with a very basic and uncomplicated mask and perfect layers. And then I merge those all together and then I have a perfect uh, effects layer up here. And that's all good to go. So here's, here's one way that I like to um, remove chromatic aberration in Photoshop. What I'll do is merge all the layers together. And in Photoshop, that's called the claw, as I like to call it. Uh, and that's Shift, Option, Command, E on a Mac. And that just gives me this perfect effects layer as a base to work off of, sort of like a background layer if I was starting from scratch. And um, from here, what I'll do is go and grab an adjustment, come over here to hue and saturation, and let's zoom in and get really close here on these uh, trees with the chromatic aberration. You can grab this slider here and sample that, and you'll see their reds pop up. And I'll just pull the saturation down on those all the way. And you can, you know, kind of jump around there and see what else is showing up, if there's anything at all. Uh, I don't see anything else. The cyans, we definitely want to bring those down. And I'm seeing another color in there, but it's not showing up. I guess it would be a, a magenta. We'll just bring that down as well. And I think that should do it. Uh, obviously the image looks horrible <laughs> right now, but what we're going to, what we're going to do from here is go back to the hue and saturation mask and I'm going to invert it on a Mac by hitting command I. So on a PC, that would just be control I. And then I'm going to hit B to bring up a brush. And then if you hit control option, I'm using a Wacom tablet and uh, when you hit control option, if you just drag along the uh, the tablet with your pen, you can adjust your brush size to whatever you want instead of using the um, the brackets. And I like you know doing that a lot more. So with uh, my inverted mask here, I want to make sure that I'm painting with white, and I am over here. And I'll paint with probably 100% opacity because I want to take out all of that chromatic aberration. And then I'm just going to paint. Uh, along the tree here. And I want to be careful not to go too much into the sky. Um, there shouldn't be much of these colors in the sky, if, if any at all, but you still just want to you know, be mindful of it. Try to avoid it if you can. Uh, get a little bit bigger here on the brush. And if you think the brush might be too soft, uh, I can harden it up here a little bit. Okay, I think that's going to be a little bit better. And this is very this is very subtle work here. If you uh, if you were just going to send this image to the web to share on a blog or something, um, removing this chromatic aberration isn't probably going to be completely necessary. So <clears throat> really the only reason I would do this is if I'm, you know, really proud of the image, if I want to send it to a gallery perhaps, <clears throat> if I want to enter it into a uh, competition of any sort or send it to a, a magazine perhaps then then chromatic aberration is absolutely you know not acceptable and I will go through it with a fine tooth comb and make sure that uh, it's not present at all and you know really one thing to note is that this is with a uh, shot with a Canon 1DS Mark uh, 3 and on top of that I was using an L series uh, 24 to 70 lens so this is supposed to be very good glass with very minimal chromatic aberration. And you can see that even, you know, with something like that, chromatic aberration is still gonna pop up from, uh, from time to time. So with this blue here, I'm gonna create a separate um, adjustment layer here. Come in, now that the sky is kind of shifted to red over here, 
I can just select blue, uh, or cyan in this case, I guess. There should be some blue in there too. There it is. Uh, invert that again, grab my brush, uh, make it a little bit smaller, and then just come along the ridge line here and remove that. Okay, and you just want to be very careful and just stick to the blue as much as possible without you know going beyond that. You can see I took some of the sky out here in the other layers, so I'll switch to black by hitting X and paint that back in there. It's a very subtle change, of course, but nonetheless, it's one that's important to make. And we'll just bring that back anywhere we can. Good. All right, back to the uh, to the other one. Removing blues. Switch back. There we go. <clears throat> You can see where it can get a little bit tricky here. If you're uh, trying to remove a blue chromatic aberration from a blue background, you'll have to really be careful there not to uh, remove the background at all, which I'm doing here, because there is a little bit of blue you know, hidden in here. All right, remove it from here. And you always have to you know, consider your perspective too where I'm zoomed in right now to a hundred percent. And if you're viewing this on the web, you're not going to be viewing it anywhere near a hundred percent. So when I zoom out, these chromatic aberrations will be, you know, much less noticeable. Okay. Right. Again, this takes a long time, as you can see. I have plenty to talk about, but sometimes you just have to concentrate and get to work and get it done. That's what I'm doing here. Just going quickly along the ridge line. I try not to get into the sky. As you can see, it's kind of bleeding over there, and I'll correct that here in a second. All right, so I'll just flip that over by hitting X again, and then I'll just draw anywhere that I see the gray coming into the sky. I'll just get really, really close there. Be careful as possible. Right, I think that looks pretty decent. You can see some red chromatic aberration here, which I'll remove real quick. Stuff is very pesky, so hopefully in the very near future, they'll be able to fix this issue entirely in lenses, so we don't have to worry about it anymore. That would be a lifesaver. Alright, zoom out all the way. And the last thing I wanted to do, there was a, and the, again, this isn't perfect, but I can't spend all day on a video because I don't want y'all to get too bored uh, watching. But the last thing I wanted to do was when I zoom out all the way, I don't know if you can see this or not, but I can kind of tell the the brush lines or the brush strokes that I made along the edge of the tree here where it gets darker. I did that in perfect layers. And I want to even that out a little bit more um, and then make the, the background, the ridge line here, a little bit darker as well. So to do that, I will uh, create a new layer with the claw. And I'll add an adjustment layer of a curve. And then I'm just going to bring this down a little bit. With that darker, I'll hit invert again, 
just like before grab a brush and paint with white I'm gonna make this one a little bit softer and then I'll zoom back into the tree here I'm gonna paint with a fairly low opacity I'll try 20% just hit 2 and you see that change up here and then I'll just paint that in up, up to 4 And this is a very, very subtle change, just making it slightly darker. If you want to, if you're ever worried that there's no change happening, you can always just turn the layer on and off. So you can see that there. And it's just making the, uh, bringing the, the highlights back a little bit and making it a little bit more even. All right, and then get a little bit bigger of a brush and paint along this ridge line. And making this ridge line darker is just going to help the city uh, pop a little bit more and then also bring less attention to the ridge line. Um, that looks good right there, I think. All right, zoom out. And this is uh, before and after. Very small change. Not a whole lot going on there, but it's uh, it did make the image better, and that's all that matters. So. All right, from here, I can't think of a whole lot more to do. Um, you can sharpen in Photoshop, of course. So you can go down to Filter, Sharpen. Um, there's a lot of different ways to sharpen. I can do a simple uh, Smart Sharpen. I can do an Unsharp Mask. I can you know, start inverting layers and um, doing all sorts of crazy stuff. I can take it into Topaz um, Adjust 4. For this one, I'll just use the uh, simple Smart Sharpen feature. And let's look at the rocks here. So that's a 104% with the four pixel radius. I'm okay with taking it too far initially. So if I turn this off, you can see before and after. It definitely looks uh, crisper. And then the first thing I always do here is throw on a black mask. So I'll hit Option, come down here to the bottom and throw a mask on top. Uh, make sure I'm painting with the white again, which I am. And then I will selectively paint that detail in at 40% opacity, uh, just in the areas that I want it. You don't want to add no, uh, sharpening to skies, obviously, because the sky is smooth and you want to keep uh, noise out of the sky as much as possible. And sharpening brings noise with it. Uh, almost in all cases so on a you know on a rough surface or one with a lot of detail already like this uh, little town here I'm not concerned about noise as much because it's not gonna you know show through very uh, it's not gonna be very apparent rather so you definitely want to bring some detail into the rocks here because they're in the foreground you want everything in the foreground to be as sharp as possible and to pop if it's uh, in focus like it is. And then this boat here, I think this boat is kind of, uh, I think this boat is kind of the star of the show here. So we definitely want to make that nice and sharp. All right, we'll zoom out. And I think that should do it. So I think we're completely done with this image now. So from here, if I was completely done, first I would save it out as a PSD and keep that on hand. And then when I wanted to send it off as a JPEG, you would just hit Shift uh, Command E. That's similar to the claw, but there's no option key in there. Uh, I don't need that one. And that just merges all the layers into one. And then I would file save out as a full resolution JPEG. So um, that's it. Thanks for sticking along with me for the Photoshop section if you did. And I will uh, talk to you later. Thanks, guys. Bye.